Okay, Chair, you're now live. Hey, good evening. I'm Councillor Anthony McEwen, Leader of High Peak Borough Council, and welcome to tonight's Climate Change Working Group meeting. In addition to myself, the other members of the Working Group are Councillor David Lomax, Tony Ashton, Joanna Collins, Linda Gruby, Ian Huddleston, Graham Oakley, Shannon Thompson, Jean Todd, Alan Barrow, Charlotte Farrell, Madeline Hall, Tony Kemp, Kath Thompson, and Emily Frame. Also present, and my apologies for mispronouncing this, is Zizi Hine from the High Peak Green Network. Officers in attendance include Mark Trello, Mark Forrester, Kimberly Gilmore, Ben Hayward, and Rachel Rourke, and Lyndon Vernon from our Democratic Services team. I'd like to inform everyone present that the public part of this meeting will be broadcast live via the internet and via the Council's website and will be capable of repeat viewing. The image and sound recording may be used for training purposes within the Council. In order to ensure that the meeting is effectively managed, can everyone please keep to the following guidelines for speaking? Councillors should use the raise my hand function to request to speak, only speak when invited to do so by the Chair, and once you've spoken, please lower your hand. Please set your mobile phone to silent for the duration of the meeting and remember to switch off your microphone and camera when not speaking. This will help to reduce background noise and minimise demand on your internet connection. Any views expressed by any speaker in the meeting are the speaker's own and they do not necessarily affect the views of the council. Please can members be aware that the webcast will continue to be streamed live 10 seconds after the close of the meeting. This is due to a time delay in transmitting. Start with agenda item one, apologies for absence. We have apologies from councillors Kemp and Huddleston and Shannon Thompson may be late today. Thank you, Rachel. Are there any other apologies? Move on then to agenda item two. Are there any declarations of interest for the meeting, either disclosable pecuniary interests or other interests? No, nope. move on then to agenda item three, minutes of the previous meeting, uh, which are included in the agenda pack from pages three to 52, which includes the presentations. David. Move those as correct record, Chair. Thank you. And is there a seconder for that? I'll second. Thank you, Jean. Are we all okay that they reflect our previous meeting? Yeah, happy with that, Jim. Okay. Move on then to agenda item four. Uh, actions since the last meeting. Uh, to a certain extent, with the elections in the middle, there's not been as many training events that have taken place during the last month. The biodiversity group has met in between, uh, but we're getting details through from both uh, the LGA in the East Midlands and the LGA nationally about a range of training events that will be coming up over the next couple of months and we'll get details of those circulated to members. Um, we'll move again to agenda item five, update on the draft action plan. Uh, Mark, I presume? Hi, Chair. Just having trouble here. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Oh, that's okay. Um, yeah, the, the action plan is in its uh, final form uh, to bring to committee to be approved. So we, we have that, we've reached that point with the plan. Questions from members on that? Joanna. I actually thought we were going to see the action plan each time to see how it's getting on and have a report against it. Am I wrong about that? Mark, do you want to come back? It's, I mean, I mean if Chair Anthony, if, if you want to, that's certainly possible. We can circulate that. Obviously, the current draft is with yourself and Councillor Todd. 
um, and quite happy, you know, beyond that to circulate at your instruction. Okay, we can, we can do that. I mean, essentially at the moment, it's not, it's obviously changed since the last time it came to the group, uh, but in terms of it's waiting now for pictures and artwork, etc., and various graphs to be added into it to help with the narrative text on it. Uh, but we can we can get that done. We can get that circulated around. Yeah, I think that it would be useful. And, you know, pictures are nice, but they're not really the substance of it. So, um, yeah. OK, thank you. OK, thanks, Joanna. Tony. Thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, I, I thought we were going to get more of, of an update. Um, the, at the last meeting, it was said that the update was uh, was was not being um, circulated because uh, we were running up to election. So we haven't got the update and we haven't got the plan. And Mark said it's ready. Well, uh, let's let's have a look at it and let's move on. Uh, I, I, I just fear that this group is moving too slowly. Okay. We'll get we'll get that circulated round to members tomorrow. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on the update on the action plan? Then, just in terms of the agenda, uh, the item A bit low carbon advertising. Uh, this has come through as a request from one of the members of the working group who understand they've had an email on it. And it's just a test if there's interest from the working group as to whether we should make an addition to the action plan in terms of adding in and developing a policy around uh, low carbon or suitable sort of advertising in terms of sort of advertising boards that are within the council's control, but also advertising at sort of bus stops, bus shelters, and potentially looking to add into our planning policies around any restrictions on the outside hoardings that are available. Uh, I don't know if Madeline may wish to add anything additional. Uh, thank you. That pretty much covers it. But we, we, we did say that we would have a look at within our limitations, recognising that we don't actually have uh, control over many such boards uh, to, to, to have a, a, a policy. It's particularly in, in relation to illuminated um, hoardings uh, in, in terms of uh, not having so much energy use uh, in, in not illuminating them and also in, in doing whatever we can to, uh, to, to avoid Ad advertising gas guzzlers, basically. So it, it may not be a particularly uh, large extent in having a policy because it may be that there isn't a great deal that we have responsibility for, but where we have responsibility, it would be good to have a policy in, in hand. Okay, David, and then Joanna. Thank you, Chair. I know it was only draft when we looked at it in March, but it did say that we were going to reduce grass cutting. I was a little surprised to see that we're not taking part in Nomo May and that we've cut the, uh, the grass areas as close as we normally do. I understand uh, Jean or possibly Nicola may be able to add to this. I understand there is some discussion going on within the biodiversity group. Uh, around Law Mung, because in some cases it's done to the current specifications uh, with our arrangement for DCC. Uh, but if Jean or Nicola, if you'd want to comment further. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in there, Councillor McEwen. Um, yes, as, as you just mentioned, the matter has been under discussion at the High Peak Biodiversity Group for a couple of the last meetings. Um, and um, obviously it's something that we're currently exploring um, in regards to uh, our arrangement with AES and the contractual specifications that we have dictated to them for our land, but also, as you say, there are responsibilities that we undertake on behalf of Derbyshire County Council Highways in regards to verge cutting. Um, 
in all honesty, um, in regards to the no mo may, um, I wasn't actually aware of, of the scheme until um, very recently, probably only about two weeks ago myself. But our grass cutting has been delayed significantly this year due to um, the cold weather in March and April. And we've only actually started our mowing in May, um, although that has been restricted in a lot of areas because of the amount of rainfall we've had. So um, the actual amount of mowing we've undertaken this year so far is much reduced from normal years when we would normally start mowing in late March. Um, so we, we probably had a no mow April in, regard, in actual fact rather than a no mow May this year. But it's something we can definitely look at for the future. OK, thanks. For that. David, do you want to come back before I bring Joanna in? Uh, no, no, just so long as I don't come and cut my little bit in the next two or three days. <laughs> OK, well, well, Excuse we'll me. ask them to bear that in mind. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, I've just had a message from uh, Graham Oakley. He's having troubles with, with the team with Teams, and I've put a message on thing to Rachel to see if she can help. I don't know whether or not she's seen the message. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, Chair. Yes, Councillor Oakley is now in the meeting. Ah. Thank you. Well done, Rachel. There. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks, Alan. Thanks, Graham. Joanna? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure no mo April is quite the same as no mo May, but never mind. Um, yeah, actually, I was going to respond to the idea of having a policy about advertising. Um, yep. I mean, in principle, yeah, I don't think it's good to have um, illuminated advertisements, even if they're solar powered, they still create light, potentially create light pollution if they're, you know, other ones might be on at night. Um, but yeah, so in principle, I would agree with it, but I just wonder about enforcement. I mean, you know, there are a lot of things that this group could do and perhaps isn't doing or isn't doing fast enough. And if there isn't the capacity in the council to enforce any policy, is it really worth having one? Perhaps we need to prioritise, in other words. I think probably in terms of this type of activity, I suspect in general, in terms, I suspect the, the emphasis would be around putting in place measures before something happens. So it may be the case that we're looking at sort of, you know, in the majority of the bus shelters that we currently have management or some element of responsibility for in the high peak, most of them don't have any form of advertising. So to my mind, for some of this, it would be putting in place measures beforehand. So if we were to move to having shelters that have advertising space within them, it would be around ensuring that there's an appropriate policy in place to make sure we're getting kit that ha doesn't have you know, unsuitable advertising space. Yeah. Uh, but the main the main aim of raising it is it's obviously been raised as a an issue for us to consider. And it's just to see if there's any interest to sort of looking at developing a policy around it and if there is we'll do some work on that and as part of that we'd then look at sort of what enforcement elements would be needed and if we have any powers around being able yeah. to enforce any elements on this because it may well be the case right. that although although you know some of the enforcement powers are you know potentially wide and various we may well not have anything specific that would allow us to enforce on yeah. issues well, around it's also this whether you have the capacity to enforce yeah yeah. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Uh, much in the same vein as uh, John has just said. I think this. I, I, I have no objection to this in the in the long term, but I think at the present juncture, it could hardly be described as low hanging fruit. Um, no. And also, uh, we don't have to allow advertising in the um, uh, uh, the bus shelters that are ours, and and best of luck establishing which are ours. Um, uh, so until we do allow it, then then we can worry about it. I think we've got uh, bigger fish to fry, as it were. OK, any further comments? No, in that case, then We'll move on to our next agenda item, uh, our presentations. Uh, the theme this month is around waste. 
and we're starting off with developing and managing the circular economy in public and private sector settings uh, by Amanda Reed, who's the Waste Operations Manager at Savills UK Waste Management. Amanda. Thank you, Councillor McEwen. I will now just try and share my screen for you. And if you can just let me know. You can see everything. Yes, yep, that's yep. a lot. Okay. So there seems to be a slight um, difference in communication to what the title is going to be, but basically it will cover everything that you've you've just introduced. So just as a as a quick introduction to myself, um, as as Councillor McEwen has just um, said, I work for Savills. This is Savills. I don't know if you know about Savills. They are property. They they work within the property management sector. Um, and I've actually been asked by my local sustainability group, who is Sustainable Hayfield, to come and speak to you about my work within our sector and hopefully to see if I can support you with some local initiatives and get some ideas flowing. Um, the presentation today is about understanding and sort of an introduction to the circular economy, what that actually means. And then I'm going to run through some of the local um, council run initiatives and then talk about some of the other involvement I have sort of on a local and a, and a global scale. So in terms of my, my remit for Savills, I act as a conduit in between the contractors and the clients. So I manage big portfolios like Battersea, um, uh, the Bloomberg portfolio. My background is in waste and resource and circular economy. And I've been in the, I've been in the sector for about 20 odd years. So. Um, and prior to my work at Savills, I worked at Manchester Metropolitan University, where I ran uh, a group of academics and pulled a number of different people across Europe into funding bids, looking at valorising plastics and looking at how we can reuse and the research behind that. So without further ado, hopefully this will work. OK, so I think really... I think firstly, it's really, really important to step back and reflect on why we actually need to need to reapproach our use of resources in a more circular way. So what am I saying here? What is the issue? So this isn't, you know, this isn't rocket science. We have population increase. We have consumer increase. And with that comes obviously an increased amount of waste. And we have finite resources. So all of these things in totality add up to an increase in carbon emissions, which is causing climate change. Simple, really easy to hopefully understand. So I feel our planet is a very amazing and complex yet very fragile, vulnerable, vulnerable life system. And we've all just been through the, you know, the situation we're still in to a, to a degree. And I think we all now understand how fragile that is. And in terms of our consumption and our production patterns, we can't sustain where we are. And how do we, so how do we actually try and readdress this balance? And I think this is really, really important because the circular economy can actually help provide a solution to that. Um, I'm hoping my presentation will help you understand how. So what do we mean by the circular economy? So in order to tackle and achieve the High Peaks 2030 carbon reduction target, I think it's really essential that we transition away from this whole take, make, use and dispose, a linear model, and go beyond the waste hierarchy, which is the three R's, which is your reuse, recycle, and sorry, reduce, reuse and recycle and adopt the principles of the circular economy. So this is where waste is designed out from the beginning through concepts known as design for deconstruction and where end of life products are pulled apart to be re-engineered into new. We're designing in longevity rather than building in obsolescence is paramount. And this basically ensures that materials are kept in use and re-looped for as long as possible. And lastly, the circular economy really looks to regenerate natural systems. And this is through the use of, for example, natural products and seeking where possible to return these back into the ground. So when you're looking at food, waste, you're looking at taking it to an anaerobic digestion plant to create nitrogen rich fertilizer and to provide green energy. So the concept 
refers to an industrial economy that's restorative by intention, but it aims to rely on renewable energy. It minimises and tries to track and hopefully eliminate the use of toxic chemicals and eradicates waste through careful design. And design is the key here. It's not about what we do at the end of life. It's what we do at the beginning of it that informs how we can then we loop it back into other products at the end of life point. So there's two different um, systems here and they, these systems or the, the slide I put up here is from the Ella MacArthur Foundation. So she's our lady who single handedly sailed round the globe on her own in a yacht. She founded the, the uh, she's a founding father or founding sister should, should I say, of the circular economy. So the two different loops here, you have a biological nutrient loop which is where um, products are, re are designed to re-enter the biosphere safely and build that natural capital. So where a tree is in a forest, the leaves, the leaves fall, it then re-energizes -energ re the, the forest and creates um, biodiversity for the, for the animals and creates that living system, that life cycle. And the second side of the, the circular economy is the technical aspect in terms of the, the goods that you can't um, put back into the earth so these are designed, these are technical nutrients, and these are designed to circulate at a higher quality without re-entering the biosphere. And the whole aim of the circular economy is really to make sure that we, we where we can, re-loop everything that we're using. And essentially what we're trying to do is make the goods of today the resources of tomorrow. So... I wanted to touch very quickly upon some of the circular economy business models. Now, in order to adopt a circular economy approach, we need to have a mind shift in the way we approach our ownership of our products. And a lot of this is about the servitization model. So it's not the need for a product, it's the need for what that service provides you. And there are many different op um, sort of examples of this. So Michelin tires, for instance, um, this is non-domestic tyres. They will offer you, if you are a truck driver or you have that type of a business, the ability to hire your tyres on a mile per mile basis. And when the tyre goes back to Michelin tyres, it means they are the owner of that resource, that material, and they can revalue it. They can retread it and then send it back out. This means it's a benefit to uh, Michelin tyres because they're the owner of it. They make their product for as long as possible. So it pulls in that longevity piece. And it also means that the client who are hiring or leasing that, that piece of equipment, the tyre, is also bought in so they have a, a better value product it lasts for longer and it means that you you don't have issues with um, putting things back into or you it actually manage you manage to re-loop things so some of the other service models are obviously the, the lease um, and the repair and maintenance schemes so this is all about providing longer life and making sure that we keep our products in this in the, our looping system for as long as possible so really just to drive home again, like the, the three key principles are designing out waste and pollution, keeping materials and products in use for as long as possible and to regenerate our natural systems. So how does this actually translate into practical uptake? What can the council lead on and how can it help support these circular initiatives? Um, so. I'm not sure where you are in terms of your plan, but some of the initiatives that other councils have led on are to adopt things like a plastic free, free strategy. So linking this into businesses and making sure that you're locally um, adopting these strategies and pulling in your local business leaders to help you support that. Now, some of these can be taken in from a, a council run and sort of focus point, or they can be you know they can be broadened out and you can link in with your business in you know with your business leaders your local business leaders circular circular procurement policy is a key one so this is almost looking at where those um, benefits are and it's almost assessing them in terms of like a gap analysis and looking at where you can influence that change across your supply chain then I thought I'd talk about some of the existing community initiatives that we already have going on across the UK. 
So there are facilities for community bike repair. I think a big, big thing at the moment, and because we've all been in lockdown, a lot of people are out there um, using their bikes. There's a lot more um, fitness going on. So the, the fact that, you know, there is the ability and probably the need for community um, groups perhaps to bring together the ability to repair things like bikes and also clothing hubs. Um, I don't know if you've come across community fridges before, but this is uh, an ideal um, way of reducing the waste that's going through your system in terms of your, your municipal system. And it's shared. It, it's basically a sharing opportunity for people who perhaps wouldn't be able to buy um, as much food and you and you reduce your waste. The community fridge idea is is actually it was initiated through Hubbub, um, who I can send you the details of later on. Reuse hubs. So I don't know if you know much about Greater Manchester Combined Authorities first reuse hub. Now they're linking with obviously their service partner Suez and they are using the items from three of their 20 household waste recycling centres and developing um, bike um, repair shops, electrical repair shops and really looking at how they can re re reinvigor and reuse some of the items coming through their household waste sites. Um, library of things. This is something that I'm very passionate about. I think a number of us have a number of things within our sheds, within our garages that we perhaps don't use on a regular basis. Things like drills, things like um, ladders. Um, and these, the library of things allows you access to things. So it gives you access to um, ser services perhaps you wouldn't naturally have. And it also means that people come together as a community um, and they have, you know, they, they come together and they have the ability to use these to use these on a one off higher basis. Um, the last couple of examples on here is is looking at how we work with social enterprises to create volunteering and skill sharing partnerships, um, which link back into the sort of the reuse hubs and the shop sort of side of things. And I think. One of the other one of the other things that I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure this this is me giving you an example of how we how we actually set up things like um, the library of things. So ideally you'd need there's obviously a number of ways you can do this, but ideally you'd need a commissioning partner or a council or an anchor institution who fund the setup. Um, and then you need a hosting space, so a community hub like a library where these events can happen or a space that provides a welcoming, welcoming home to engage with that community um, and a community partner. I think the key thing for all of this is to is the link between you setting up the community led initiatives and that whole circular piece and actually reducing the burden on your um, on your bill in terms of the council tax um, for the for, for the movement of waste through your through your waste um, service provider. Some other examples we have are, now this moves across the UK, um, York Council set up a, a Recycle York, which is the biking um, repair scheme. We have a Take Tech Back, Take Take Back scheme, which is led by Brighton and Hove Council. Um, this is where things like laptops, IT equipment that's normally stashed in a cupboard um, can be taken. It can be either um, the the hard drives can be cleaned or you can have them completely taken off you and then they will revalue them and send them back out to charities or schools that perhaps need them. Um, a couple of other ones, you've probably heard of Freegal. This is an online um, app that you can join. London seems to have got on board with this quite well. They have a number of different locations across the, um, you know, the London area, Westminster and uh, Lewisham seem to be heading that up quite nicely. That's where you can basically reuse and um, you share your un unwanted items. And then the Real Junk Food Manchester, it's a, a really a, um, quite an amazing setup in terms of using supermarket waste food, but actually providing that back to the community. So it's called Open Kitchen Manchester um, and it's been running for quite a few years now, I believe. And then you have a couple of other items here, which is looking at community paint, obviously um, composting and regrowing scheme, which which would be linking in with your your service provider, which is Viola, I believe. And what else is there? So 
that was more of the council-led um, initiatives. I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot on what I actually champion at Savills. So as, pro as the property management sector, we have influence over a number of different areas. So through the planning, design, construction, and the management of all of our sites. Now I sit within the property management side and sit directly in, in um, uh, have handle on the, the management side, which is the operational piece. However, through things like local local um, targets, so your client drivers for us are things like net zero commitments, ESG commitments, obviously legislation, circular economy is driven through legislation. We also have new planning requirements for London, which came into effect in March um, this year. And this mandates the whole life carbon assessment when you're looking at building a new building. So this looks at how you can look at um, specifying new materials, low, the, uh, high performance materials with low carbon output. So and through the design process, it's really important for us to look at ways of looking at, you know, green roofs, photovoltaics, looking at passive design in terms of the heating and the cooling systems um, and construction. Construction is a huge um, emission area in terms of the way that we build. So adopting principles in terms of modular off-site construction or what's known as um, modern methods of construction um, help to reduce the amount of waste um, whilst you're in that in that phase and for us as a as a property management sector we know that if we provide green buildings the the actual average let the letable price is actually increased too um, and I've just talked about the management piece. So most of my work is looking at how our contractors can provide us with the ability to re-loop and look at things like coffee cups, look at um, coffee grounds, look at how they can support our sites um, across our portfolios and provide us with those opportunities. So a lot of this would be um, on offer, I, but I believe through your through your waste contractor who who is Beolia. And the last thing I wanted to let you know about is I'm actually the founder of the Manchester chapter for the Circular Economy Club. So I founded the, cir the, the, circular, com so the circular Economy is actually a global network. So it's in a number of different countries. And the idea of the, the network is to leverage um, um, communication, networking, and to understand what people are doing within that circular economy field within your city. We've hold, held a number of different face-to-face um, -face events, not very many online events, um, and it brings businesses and community groups together and really helps to, to share best practice in innovation. And I think if this is something that your council would like to take forward, that's something that I could definitely help support you with and maybe invite you to these meetings and help support that journey for you. I think that's probably the end of my presentation. Hopefully it's not been too disjointed in terms of the, the, the council piece and then what I actually deliver for Savills. Um, and if you have any questions, more than happy to take them. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Are there any questions? <laughs> Sorry, um, not so much questions really, but uh, one thing I should um, disabuse you of is that Veolia isn't our waste company anymore. We we now have a shared com um, waste company with a couple of other uh, authorities. It's called Alliance Environmental Services. Um, but, I mean, a lot of these things that you mentioned, like Freegal and such like, do happen in our local communities. Um, we all, it, Transition Buxton, for instance, it used to have um, a sort of library of things of quite a few years ago, and now we're sort of restarting that. That's good. Um, Was it successful uh, the first time? It it was, I, th I think it wasn't maintained too well. It, it was more on, on the website and that 
particular website wasn't particularly well designed and I think it wasn't that well used then but we're hoping but to have a, a space perhaps in uh, one of the um, town um, shops some of an empty shop is possibly something that would be something that our council could help with um, we have it does have a repair cafe as well and does a lot of the a lot of things that you've mentioned on on your um, <laughs> presentation, um, which I didn't list down. This circular economy club sounds interesting. Perhaps we could have some more details about that. Yeah, that's not a problem. I can share that with you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Madeline. Uh, thank you. I'm really impressed with the the breadth of your brief. In embracing practical community action um, on the climate emergency. I, I wonder if you've been involved in supporting uh, climate emergency centres set up as uh, community interest companies, which uh, in, in some parts of the country are already coming up uh, using meanwhile leases um, on uh, property in, on high streets, which is um, currently empty, it strikes me that with, with your particular brief and your your, your role within a property company, uh, you're, you're a perfect vortex for action there. I wonder if that's something you've come across yet. It, I, I do know about kicks. Um, it's not something I deal with directly, but if yeah, that's definitely something I could look at. And I think, you know, I think the property management sector have a long way to go. Yeah, they really do. And I think, you know, we we form, the you know, we are the city, basically, aren't we? We're managing what's going on within the city. And I think, you know, we have a huge responsibility to try and influence the people within our buildings. So it's not just offices. This is major um, shopping centres. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the lakeside, um, the Trafford Centre, we, we manage a number of different um, shopping centres and it's all about that engagement and making sure that we, we provide the right, um, you know, type of advice to our, you know, to our clients. So, yep, I will definitely take note of that and have a look at how we can support that. Oh, thank you. It, it's particularly, I think, interesting in Buxton, given that we have the uh, future high streets funding, mm -hmm. um, that, that it could actually be a, a, a precursor and practice to, uh, to, to to some of the things we want to do in terms of increasing community footfall, if you like, on the high street. Okay. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. OK, any more questions? Oh, one more. Graham. Could yeah. I just say one other thing, Anthony? Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'll bring you in after Graham, Jean. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, um, I was very interested in in everything you had to say. I think one of the one of the greatest problems that, that we face is is finding. You mentioned about finding spaces, and I think space is one of the greatest problems. I think um, there are a number of groups. Um, that either are already formed or could form, but a, a major hurdle is to find a place where they can actually function. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of a couple at the moment. Um, one, someone's trying to start up a, a cycle, a recycle cycle centre, but they're even having to look at trying to build somewhere something themselves because they just can't find a can't find anywhere where either they can rent um, or, or, or use on a, on a more uh, free basis. I know that um, Glossop Food Bank is in a similar situation. It wants to find a property that it can move into and rent. I know that's not exactly the same as, as recycling, but it, it's, it, it's performing a, a public service. It, it's almost as if we need to have some kind of um, uh, register where people can act, people who have got properties and are willing to do that um, can um, log these on and provide something where we can actually have a look and people can look at these properties. It might be it might be 
uh, for a short rent, it might be for long term, all kinds of things. But there seems to be a mismatch at the moment between groups that want to do the kind of activities we've been talking about and places that they can use um, where it's economically viable and, um, and allow them to function. I don't know if anybody's had any thoughts or got any ideas about that. A bit rambling, sorry, but uh, it's an issue I think I needed to bring up. Yeah, you, you don't want that to be, a you know, to prevent these good initiatives from happening, do you, essentially? Yeah, that's right. That's right. It, it's, it's often um, the most critical um, feature of a group that wants to do something. I mean, the, the bicycle one is an obvious one. Um, and um, it's a case of how do you find somewhere? Uh, I know both of those groups have tried advertising on um, on Facebook. Uh, they put it leafleted, um, and it, it's just a um, just a real difficulty. And it's such a shame when people have got tremendous enthusiasm and they're um, they're they're facing a, a real block. Is there nothing the council can do to sort of leverage that relationship with um, things like li maybe libraries that are not used? I don't know. There, there must be. There must be a way of supporting these community, uh, well, they're not established, are they yet? But these community groups to set up in in spaces that are free. Um, the other the other route, obviously, is you crowdfund, and then you have the money from that to start you up. But it you know it depends on what the model is and how you're using it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I've got Jean, then Joanna, then Charlotte. Sorry, you, yes, you mentioned um, also modular building. Uh, we recently had a, a tender for building for a development and there was a very good um, company that uh, had modular building. Unfortunately, we couldn't choose them because the, the size of the, uh, the the size of the houses that, that they were able to bring didn't actually fit in with the standard room sizes. And um, I don't know whether you have any problems with that kind of thing when you're suggesting in London that they've. I've not. I've not come across it directly. I'm sure probably some of the people within Savills may have. Um, yeah, it seems quite dis it's disjointed again, isn't it? It's that, yeah, yeah, you're trying to do the right thing. But if you, is, was it a service supplier issue perhaps? Or was it the planning, it's something to do with the planning that they need to provide a certain space requirement for each of you? Yeah, there are, that was the, the reason, yeah. Uh, but it was much the best climate change um, mitigation supplier that was yeah. that tendered. <clears throat> um, okay, and the other thing was the single-use plastics. I mean, we we there is an initiative we with that that uh, Transition Buxton is doing that again, and with surface against sewage, and we should shortly be registered as being a plastic. Not exactly plastic free zone, but it's it's going towards that. And it's certainly got quite a lot of businesses on board and yeah. that, that sort yeah. of thing. I and the council that's is that's doing it. You need, you, need, you need the gravity behind you and you need the support from the businesses to adopt that. And then, you know, everybody wins. You get the engagement. Um, it's to get to get the business on, businesses on board with, you know, yeah. engagement. They are, they are registering, oh. yeah. It's good. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Joanna? I wondered, I mean, the, you know, really following on from what Graham was saying, and Madeline as well, actually, there are so many empty properties in Buxton, empty shops. Is there anything the council can do with, say, Transition Buxton, if they're having a library of things or a, or other groups that need premises to, to sort of facilitate that, to get
get mm. people in touch with landlords who might give you know short cheap leases while they can't rent out their property because we've talked you know the conversation seems to be going in the right direction but is there anything the council can actually do we can take that back and have a look at it with the regen team and see if there's anything we can practically look at i think the biggest difficulty in some cases not all of the landlords are particularly local in terms of their properties and particularly at the Buxton end, uh, as a council, we just don't own any of these properties to add in some of that flexibility. No. Uh, but we'll take no, it back to Regen what... and see if there's anything that they can work with. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it, you have to spin it as ESG, as Amanda suggested, especially with bigger companies, actually, who might be looking at that. OK, yeah. Charlotte? Thanks. Um, it's just a question for Amanda about the Library of Things, really. Um, I just wondered how you get by um, sort of liability if, you know, if somebody was using a drill and it exploded or something like that. Mm. Uh, has that ever been an issue? Because I, these, these, these examples that I've given you are not something that I've been personally involved with. I've just been taking them off as examples from... Oh, okay around the UK so yes that would be my, my my first thought is who is liable who is liable for, for the maintenance of these and yeah. I think you set yourself up um, through whatever funding route you find you would have to make sure that you are either signing an indemnity form when you take those pieces of equipment out but they'd obviously need to be pat tested so you know there is a level of kind of responsibility to setting up a, a library of things especially if you're using things like electrical items um if you're going to drill a finger you know if you're going to drill a hole through your finger though that's nothing to do yeah uh, slightly different but yeah i yeah i'm not quite sure how you would get around that practically but i should imagine you would have to sign things out and it would be um yeah the relationship would be between the person who has the item and they're taking it away and that person who's providing that service so in a way, it's quite a good thing for a council to sort of run to have that degree of control. Yeah. yeah. Also, are we discussing other things about this later? Um, I mean, just generally, I'm just thinking about all the stuff that gets taken to the water swallows tip that um, probably could be reused. So I don't know. There's a discussion carrying on. This is yeah, we do generally. We do have a, a separate bit after the presentations for okay. discuss any that. discussion and sort of suggested actions from it. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Amanda. If there's no further questions, we'll move on to our second presentation, uh, which is on resources and waste strategy consultation and engagement with the Energy Saving Trust from Nicola Kemp. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will try and share my screen. Hopefully this also works and we have no technological problems. Just bear with me. Does the previous speaker have to unshare? My, my side's still egg timing at the moment, so I don't know if that's just ah, my, uh, <laughs> my slow internet connection. <laughs> Just, I'm getting there now. Um, can everyone see that? Yep. Excellent. Okay, so um, thank you for introducing me tonight. Um, as uh, the agenda states, um, what I am planning to talk about tonight is to provide an overview of future government direction in regards to waste management and service provision and there are a couple of slides towards the end um, around some work we are um, doing in regards to trying to green our fleet which obviously is heavily involved in the, in the waste service as well so um, the agenda um, will start off by looking at the resources and waste strategy um, which was released in 2018 by government 
um, provide an update in regards to progress and delivery of those aspirations. And there's been two pieces of consultation by government um, undertaken, one which occurred in 2019, um, a further one which is currently underway. Um, I'm hoping to discuss some of the implications for ourselves. And as I said at the end, I'll touch on um, the work we're trying to do in greening our fleet, which obviously is, is very critical as well. Um, so I'll, I'll start by giving a bit of an apology, I suppose. Um, inevitably, this is quite a heavy subject um, and I don't have any nice pictures on my slides um, as Amanda did. So it's all very wordy. Um, I'm going to try and give you an overview of this topic, which inevitably is very heavy in content and um, quite technical at times. So hopefully um, I'll, I'll give you a good enough overview and then of course, happy to answer any questions at the end. Um, so as I said at the start, um, government published its new resources and waste strategy on the 18th of December, 2018, which um, is quite some time ago now, to be honest. Um, and uh, obviously the last year flew past with all the pandemic issues, but. Um, the aspiration of the new strategy is to provide a series of commitments and areas for further consultation, ultimately aiming to reduce waste and promoting resource efficiency, including the elimination of avoidable waste of all kinds by 2050. And it has two overarching objectives, that being to maximise the value of resource um, and to minimise waste and its impact on the environment. And I think it's fair to say that this strategy is the first government strategy um, linked to waste, which is really focused on resources. And you can see that from the title. It's actually not a waste strategy this time, which is what we've had previously. It's a resources and waste strategy. And the emphasis is on resources being the first part of the, the title. So uh, a clear demonstration that we're, we're recognising the impact of that. Um, so the strategy sets out five strategic principles. I've put them there on the screen um, for you to read, but um, it aims to provide incentives, be they regulatory or economic, um, to ensure that infrastructure, information and skills are in place so that we can all do the right thing in regards to waste, using resources better, etc. The idea is to prevent waste from occurring in the first place and manage it better when it does. So that links back very closely with Amanda's presentation on the circular economy. Um, to ensure that those who place products on the market, which become waste, take greater responsibility in regards to the costs of disposal. And this is what's known as the polluter pays principle. So um, at the moment, we've got a system in the UK which really does not um, enable the polluter, the producer of that product, to pick up the costs of waste management. And quite often, unfortunately, that falls on local authorities, be they waste collection authorities, waste disposal authorities or unitary authorities. Um, the other strategic principles are to lead by example so that we are um, demonstrating a commitment um, to these aspirations, both domestically and internationally, and leading by example and to allow our ambition not to be un under to undem undermined, sorry, I couldn't speak, by criminality. So obviously looking at things like enforcement action where it's required, um, trying to remove um, the ability for criminals to interact. Oh, I'm sorry, I seem to have lost the ability to move on my slides. What's going on here? Ah, oh, there we go. OK, um, the strategy also seeks to deliver five strategic ambitions to work towards all plastic packaging being recyclable, reusable or compostable by 2025, to eliminate food waste to landfill by 2030, eliminate avoidable plastic waste over the lifetime of the 25 year environment plan, double resource productivity by 2050 and eliminate avoidable waste of all kind by 2050. The strategy is proposing a number of key changes which will be pivotal to change the face of waste management in the future. And I think it's fair to say that um, coming from a waste management background, um, it's welcomed that government are actually recognising the need for these changes. It's quite radical in some senses, um, but also it will ultimately turn waste management in the UK on its head. Um, and in doing that, the government is wanting to look at a number of key areas, and these have um, been linked to the consultations that have happened so far. So 
they want to look at um, what is known as EPR, enhanced producer responsibility. So this is the kind of producer pays principle. So they want to reform the UK packaging producer responsibility system. Um, and that means that um, those businesses that produce those waste um, streams in the first place fund the collection and processing of the waste so that the money is paid into the system and organisations such as ourselves as local authorities actually don't have to pick up the financial burden of dealing with waste products, um, which is obviously really welcomed um, for a local authority. They also want to look at a plastic packaging tax. So this will be a tax on businesses that produce or import plastic packaging. And the aim is there to ensure that those items have an increased recycled content. So that will obviously provide an economic incentive for businesses to increase their use of recycled material and therefore in turn stimulate increased levels of recycling, the need to collect plastic in the first place, which is the circular economy diverting it from landfill or incineration and actually turning it back into another product, which is ultimately um, brilliant from a, a waste management point of view. And the strategy is proposing that businesses will have until April 2022 to adapt the processes before the introduction of this tax. So actually, we're not that far off that introduction now happening. They also want to look at introducing what we um, in the industry refer to as DRS, a deposit return scheme in the UK. Um, these are in operation in other parts of Europe and um, I'm sure many of you like me will remember schemes such as sweat sheps um, that many years ago you got 5p back on a glass bottle. It's exactly the same principle. Um, so this is aiming to um, put an extra charge on the purchase price of packaging. Um, so the purchaser obviously pays uh, an extra cost on top of their um, purchase of a product. Um, that money um, then is passed back to those who have to deal with the waste processing or treatment of those products. It's hoped that that will again link to increased container recycling that it will tackle issues such as drinks container litter. So hopefully we won't see plastic bottles discarded around as litter or cans, um, which people have drank on the go or out when they're in parks or open spaces. Um, and the aspiration in the strategy is for that proposal to be introduced by 2023. Um, but of course, obviously, it will have an impact on the public. Um, they'll have um, increased cost at the point of purchase, but they'll be able to get that money back if they recycle that product. So the idea is um, take back schemes, which may be available in supermarkets or certain outlets where residents will be able to take back um, their containers and get the 20p back um, for each can or glass or plastic bottle that they recycle. They wouldn't, though, see that payment if they used our council's recycling services, so our brown bin scheme as an example. And the last big change is in, in regards to consistency in recycling collections in England. So this is trying to get a consistent standardised service across the country. We often hear members of the public complaining that they move into a new council area, the service is totally different, they don't understand what materials they should be collecting, what colour bin they have to use. And this consistency approach that governments are looking to introduce would standardise the materials that all waste collectors, including local authorities, would have to collect for recycling. It will stipulate what types of premises we have to provide those collections from, how we have to undertake those collections and at what frequency. And by doing that, it is hoped that that will increase recycling performance nationally, removing the inconsistencies and therefore um, residents um, and businesses will recycle more because they'll have a better understanding of the service. So, as I said, the strategy was released in December 2018 and it gave a commitment that certain consultations would happen. And in spring 2019, the government undertook four initial consultations, um, that being on those four topics that I've just covered, the plastic tax, the deposit return scheme, the consistency in collections and the enhanced producer responsibility. And 
Um, obviously, the opportunity there was for um, individuals, businesses, local authorities to respond to the consultation, and those results were published in autumn 2019. And the results of that consultation response gathering was that there was further consultation needed because a lot of the detail wasn't documented in the initial consultation documents. So certainly for us as local authorities, certain things were proposed, but they didn't really give us some of the detail that we needed to be able to then look at our services. Um, and obviously at this stage as well, it was consultation. So these aspirations aren't entwined in, in law yet. Um, the government in autumn 2019 gave a commitment that further consultation was expected in spring 2020. Clearly, they then didn't appreciate we were going to be into a, a national and uh, global pandemic. So unfortunately, that has been delayed. And as a result, for the last year, we've been eagerly awaiting um, the next round of consultation, which I'm pleased to say actually was launched in April. So DEFRA launched consultation on EPR and DRS, and they gave 10 weeks for that consultation um, to be responded to. That's still open for anybody to respond to. And the closing date for responses is the 4th of June. So if you're an interested party and you want to individually respond, you're totally entitled to. You can access it through the DEFRA website. Um, we have been reviewing um, the consultation in partnership with other authorities across Derbyshire and obviously because um, of our alliance also across Staffordshire. Um, so we have been developing a kind of partnership response um, that we're looking to submit. And then post the elections in May, um, DEFRA also issued the consistency consultation, which actually for local authorities is um, the critical consultation because ultimately this will significantly impact how we collect waste and recyclables from our residents or businesses. And actually, it's very much intertwined with the EPR um, consultation and proposals as well as DRS. So it has been very difficult for us to consider the impact of EPR and DRS on ourselves without the consistency consultation. And as I said, the reason for that really is the DRS scheme ultimately could reduce the amount of recyclable materials we end up collecting from the curbside because residents may be taking those products back to supermarkets or other outlets um, to get back their 20p or whatever the value is. And EPR will ultimately change the funding streams for any changes that we are forced to make in regards to our waste or recycling services. Um, so the um, consistency consultation, again, is still live if you wanted to individually respond. Um, we've had a shorter period um, for the consultation. We've only been given eight weeks this time, which is quite tight. Um, and the responses are due by the 4th of July. And I will just add that um, I'm currently working um, with uh, Matthew and my team to work up a response on behalf of High Peak Borough Council in regards to the consistency consultation and a report will be um, produced in the coming weeks um, that obviously you may have an interest in reading and commenting on. Um, Inevitably, as I said, the pandemic delayed the, this round of consultation and that has resulted in some of the timeframes that were proposed in the strategy when it was published in 2018 being reviewed. But at the moment, the suggested timeline of implementation is for most changes in regards to consistency and um, EPR and DRS to be introduced during 2023, so only two years away and um, to be operational by the start of 2024. Those though are things that they are asking about in regards to realism, in regards to the, um, the consultation. So clearly, again, they could change if feedback is over overwhelmingly um, showing that those timeframes are um, not suitable or inadequate. But ultimately, once these changes are implemented and um, the aspiration is for these changes to be enshrined in the Environment Bill, which is going through, I believe it's third reading at Parliament um, at the moment. It will increase the quantity and quality of material that we recycle as a nation, enclose closed loop recycling, so that's the, the circular economy. It should simplify messaging and guidance for residents and businesses, so hopefully they understand what they need to do. And again, reduce the amount of litter, so all positive in reality. 
Um, so the implications for ourselves, ultimately, there could be significant changes that we need to do in regards to the collection services that we offer to businesses and residents. Um, so you may be aware that we're only a waste collection authority. We're not responsible for the disposal of our waste. That responsibility lies with Derbyshire County Council. So for us, it is in regards to the collection of our um, waste and recyclables, um, as I said, from businesses and residents. And because we're still going through consultation, nothing yet is definite um, and it won't be definite until it is enshrined in law. But what we do know is still being proposed, so it hasn't changed from the first round of consultation to the second, is that government are confirming that any costs that we incur, if we're forced to change services, will be borne via new burdens and that local authorities will not be worse off as a result of the need for change. I will caveat that there, uh, though, because they say that they will pay for capital investment. So should we have to purchase new containers, new vehicles, um, they would obviously cover those costs and they confirm that they will cover the transitional cost for change. They don't necessarily say that they will cover any increased ongoing costs. So we have to hope there that the changes to the enhanced producer regulations will fund the changes um, that they're proposing. But at the moment, we don't know that will definitely happen because EPR is only for packaging. So it's only for those products that are commonly contained around food or drinks products, not necessarily garden waste, food waste, things like that, or even paper actually. Um, what we do know is that waste management in the UK will be funded very differently and producers should have to pay for the impact of their products. So ultimately the book won't lie with local authorities any longer. And we do know that every local authority or waste collector will have to provide its residents and businesses with a mandatory weekly food waste collection. So clearly that's very different to the services that we currently provide. We collect food alongside garden waste in our green lidded bins. We don't currently offer that to businesses in our area. It's something that we were looking to launch last year um, and that got delayed with the pandemic and obviously the focus on maintaining the services that we were. So that's something we will um, be picking up again. But um, we obviously collect that waste stream at the moment fortnightly. Government are wanting that to be provided weekly and that food waste is collected separately from garden waste. So clearly there's a, a significant change for us there to consider. They're also saying that every local authority or waste collector will have to collect from its residents and businesses a range of materials, which includes glass bottles and jars, paper and card, plastic bottles, pots, trays and tubs, steel and aluminium cans, foil and aluminium tubes. And in the consultation, consideration is being given for flexible plastics and films to be introduced at a later date, recognising um, the issue that those items cause. So it's the area that confuses residents most in regards to what plastic can I put into my brown bin. So it will aid um, a reduction in contamination for us if those items are included. But ultimately, they're not collected at the moment because there isn't really a demand for those types of plastics to be collected. There isn't a demand from companies that use those type of plastics in production of new goods. And that's, again, where this closed loop needs to happen. So we need through the plastics tax for those plastics to be in demand um, by businesses that produce products um, for us then to have a justified reason to collect them. So the consideration is that the collection of flexible plastics and films may not start until 2027, 28 or after. And um, we also know for definite that these materials, so food waste and uh, glass, paper, plastics, metals, should always be collected separately from each other and from residual waste. Um, what we don't yet know is whether we'll be permitted to collect some of those materials together. So as we know at the moment in our brown bins, we have a commingled recycling service. We collect those recyclable uh, items together that may not be permitted going forward. Um, what is being discussed in the consultation is whether certain items can be collected together. 
Um, and the reason for that is to drive up quality so that um, it's recognised that um, fibre, i.e. paper and card, can often be um, of a lower quality when collected with other material streams. Inevitably, there may be cross-contamination from liquid residues out of bottles or cans or food residues from some of the other containers, the glass bottles, jars, etc. So the idea there is to tackle a quality issue. Um, but of course, again, if we aren't permitted to collect them together, and we have to be able to demonstrate that through an assessment, it's discussed in the consultation yet to be agreed what that assessment will look like, um, we could have to change the way we collect those materials and we may not be able to collect them in the way we currently do. And as I said earlier, the timeframes for the changes to be implemented are up for discussion in the consultation, recognising that we've lost a year and a half since the strategy was first published. We've also got to give consideration to the impact that COVID, for example, could have on something like a deposit return scheme. So um, government are obviously looking at those um, aspects as well. And then moving on um, to greening our fleet. Um, so I just thought I'd give you some stats there in regards to the current fleet that we operate in the high peak. We operate 97.5 vehicles, um, 23 of which are used by Alliance Environmental Services in delivering our waste and recycling services. So the large proportion of those are refuse collection vehicles, RCVs. Um, we have 35 and a half used by AES in delivering street cleansing and parks functions. And you probably thought, how do we have half a vehicle? Well, we have half because we actually have three shared vehicles which are owned 50-50 by SMDC and HPBC. So I've split the three by um, two, obviously, to give us one and a half. We have 32 vehicles used by our housing repairs and caretakers team, five by CareLink, and we have a mayor's car and a van. Uh, which was historically used by the Revs and Benz team. And in addition to that, we have a range of other vehicles used primarily for grounds maintenance duties. So be it used in our grave digging functions at our cemeteries, mowing our um, fields and open spaces and parks, and obviously um, verge maintenance, etc. And what we're looking to do to um, kind of review our fleet um, because of our aspirations to be carbon neutral by 2030 is um, in, back in March, I submitted an application to the Energy Saving Trust. Um, they will undertake a free of charge review of fleet and make recommendations in regards to future procurement. And they'll be looking at the whole infrastructure need that we may um, require to support that as well. So it's not just looking and saying we need to move to electric vehicles. It will be looking at whether our um, sites and locations can accommodate electric charging points, um, because obviously a lot of these vehicles are parked in our depots, which AES um, operate from. But for the housing repairs and caretakers team and care link, those vehicles are generally taken home by the employees. So we've got to think about the practicalities of if we move to electric vehicles or another alternative fuel for those, how would they get charged or um, filled um, to enable those employees to do their job? So we've been told that the review by the Energy Saving Trust will take approximately six months and um, I've got a meeting next month with the officer um, at EST. He'll be doing that work for us. I'd like to think that we may have a report back from them before the end of this calendar year. So what are we doing until we have a strategy in place? So ultimately, once EST have undertaken their work and we've got a report back. We'll be looking to develop a strategy, uh, which of course will come in front of members. Um, but until we have that, um, we are undertaking fleet procurement um, as is required. So inevitably we do still need to replace some vehicles. And most recently, um, earlier this year, we are, have looked at replacing a number of our light commercial vehicles. And in doing that with AES, we asked for prices and options looking at alternative fuel as well as diesel. Um, and the response from that was documented in a um, report. Um, the contract has been awarded for that. Unfortunately, whilst we did have some responses for electric vehicles, um, we didn't actually go with any of the options. Uh, it was really limited the response um, for those. 
and we've got the issue of not having any charging capabilities at the moment. But we'll continue to work with AES, who are our fleet provider, to consider options to green our fleet. So we'll continue to look to reduce fuel usage. That, be, that could be through making our services more efficient, looking at how we drive our vehicles, how we service um, our residents and provide the functions. So looking at our collection rounds to make sure they're as efficient as possible. And that in turn will reduce carbon emissions. And some of the activities that AES have already undertaken, including trialling electric RCV, a refuse collection vehicle, and a light commercial van earlier this year. And I would add that they um, generated some challenges for us. Um, inevitably, we're not a flat district and um, the limitations of the battery life were um, quite quickly discovered. Um, we were unable to complete a full day's work with an electric refuse collection vehicle, which um, meant that um, another vehicle then had to be sent out to complete the work. So it's all these kind of challenges we need to think about in regards to going forward, how we may change our fleet. Um, AES have also undertaken a fuel additive trial that was undertaken last year. Um, that aim to reduce um, carbon emissions and unfortunately that didn't prove successful so um, that trial um, hasn't been taken forward. They are also exploring options for conversion of some vehicles to run on cooking oil so this would be some of our smaller vans. Um, again obviously using resources better that's the aspiration there and ANSA who are an AES shareholder are undertaking a hydrogen vehicle trial over at their site at Middlewich. So we are obviously keeping an eye on that and we'll, we'll use that information as well. So that concludes my presentation. Um, don't know if anybody's got any questions, but I'm happy to obviously take them now. Thanks, Nicola. Any questions, any questions or comments? Or comments? Well, it would seem for the moment you stunned everyone to say. I have. <laughs> um, I am also conscious that um, there was a, a the next item um, was uh, down for Councillor Todd, but I, I think obviously the the, copy, the topics do cross each other. So again, I'm happy to take any questions on that if any uh, anybody's got any. Okay, Joanna. Yeah, just sorry, I probably missed it, but I wondered if the council was responding to the DRS consultation, because it seems to me that it's possible it's going to give a lot of work to councils. Um, yeah, I, I'm obviously we're still working through the consultations. As I said, we're, we're working with our partners across the county, actually, in regards to that. Um, the, these consultations are not just aimed, obviously, at local authorities. So a, a, a large number of the questions in that consultation are actually aimed more so at producers of packaging. Um, therefore, there's a limited amount that actually we can comment on. But you're right, there are some questions that are linked to um, how the payments would be made to us, um, but not really in a great amount of detail yet. I think it's probably going to be expected that more will come on that. Um, but there are some of those questions also in the consistency as well. So we're not individually looking to do a response on, on the DRS. Well, that's fair enough. Yeah. Thank you. OK, Jean. Yeah. Uh, as Nicola said, I think she's covered everything in the next item, but I've got a, uh, just a couple of questions. Do, with the food waste, do you th think that um, they're suggesting that we should be processing that differently to the way we process our garden waste? I mean, should it be in an anaerobic composter? Yes, I think that's ultimately the aspiration of it being collected separately. Um, from garden waste. So again, we don't know um, if the collection of food waste with garden waste will be permitted yet. It's under consultation, um, clearly still, and questions are posed around that. But the, the reason for looking to separate food waste is 
um, ultimately that by sending, sending it to an anaerobic digestion facility would not only produce a compost product, which is what happens currently to the garden and food waste that we send to the in-vessel composting facility at Water Swallows, it also produces a byproduct, which is an energy source. So you're getting two benefits from um, reprocessing the food waste through an AD plant. You're getting another energy source, which clearly is of benefit as well as the compost. And by collecting um, or processing food waste with garden waste through in vessel composting, you don't get that energy source. So it's it's seen at a kind of lower um, level um, by government. Um, clearly, and the benefits of AD um, with the energy are obviously the overwhelming argument. And the other question I've got was, um, how, I don't think it covers, the consultation covers manufacturers producing things so that they're not in sealed units, so that they're able to be actually repaired by, by you know, ordinary people ordinary um, electrical suppliers, this kind of thing? No, it isn't. And that's because actually the law has just changed in regards to that separately. So that's that um, uh, has been dealt with via a totally separate piece of legislation that um, now requires producers of electrical products to enable sale of parts to be easier so that they are easily repairable and therefore should mean that you don't need to replace a washing machine whole scale just because one small element of it has failed. So that's been dealt with totally separately. Yeah. OK. I don't know whether anyone else has got any questions on that on that report that was provided with the. From APSI. But anyway, I'll leave that to Nicola to answer. <laughs> OK, any more questions for Nicola? No, in that case, then, thank you for your presentation, Nicola. We'll thank move you. on to discussion and suggested actions from the presentations. Uh, if anyone wants to start us off, I think, Charlotte, you wanted to raise something. Well, well I was just going to ask what happens to all the stuff in... Um, they have a big container at Water Swallows with loads and loads of electrical items and computers and all sorts in. What happens to that? Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, I don't know. And can uh, we do you have to come in there, Chair? Really? Yeah, if you can, please, Nicola. Yeah, not a problem. Um, Councillor Farrell, that, that facility is obviously not provided by yourselves. It's provided by Derbyshire County Council. But what I do know... Um, similar to the electricals that we collect um, through our bulky service, those items do go for recycling, so they're separated down in, into their component parts rather than being sent for reuse. So there is um, recycling happening already, but we don't have reuse facilities on the county council's um, HWRCs, which um, are based at Water Swallows or Glossop. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. I know, I know there is some interest and it may well be something that uh, the Community Select Committee may want to raise in the future because I know Councillor Baker from up in Tint Whistle, he's sort of interested in seeing if there's any opportunities around being able to include that type of facility uh, in the future. OK, I've got Linda, then Graham. Uh, yeah, just for information, there is a, a planning application in from Suez to create a reuse facility at Water Swallows now. So that's sitting with, Derby sitting with Derbyshire County Council now. Oh, that's good news. Yep. Thanks, Linda. Graham? Um, I, I seem to remember Jean telling us that um, uh, our recycling percentage had been... Uh, seem to have plateaued and have been edging up um, and I'm wondering um, whether I'm not the only person that is still pretty ignorant about what you can put in the brown bin. Um, I don't know whether there's been any research as to why people, some people do not recycle um, but I, I, I would have thought that 
uh, ignorance is um, part of that reason. And I'm wondering why we don't um, renew the signage on our bins. Um, every now and then we, some stuff has been put on the bin, but um, I noticed when I've been wandering around uh, my area, most of the bins have got no signage on them at all. Um, and whether um, we can be a bit more specific about what people can put in. I've been asked by residents, can you put these waxed containers in? Um, I, th I, I still think there's a lot of people not too sure, as we've really been told about the plastics, uh, which kind of plastics can they uh, can they recycle? But I think generally people still don't know what they do with small electrical equipment. Um, and I'm just wondering whether it's time we, we should be putting mo uh, more signage up on the bins, something that we can just stick on um, either on the inside of the lid or something else um, as a kind of a, a, a reminder. OK, thanks, Graham. I'll ask Nicola to come back on that one. I mean, in terms of ongoing research, there's a whole variety of stuff going on. And I'm sure folk will recall that it would have been, it's probably getting on for about 12, 15 months ago now. There was one of those TV shows looking at sort of recycling and the, the differences between councils that featured a property and some high peak residents in terms of sort of their journey to being able to recycle more. Nicola? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, um, I mean, Councillor Oakley's point is fair. Um, when we rolled out the brown bins back in 2012, we um, did issue a sticker on all those bins, and actually that sticker was purposely put inside the lid so that it didn't wear um, by weather, um, rain or sun. So it would be difficult to see if those, those stickers were still present if you're just walking a past a bin. Um, but we can certainly look um, to work with AES. We have ongoing dialogue with them. They are responsible now for all communications in regards to our waste services. Um, quite a lot of the time we focus our efforts around social media. Information on our website should be quite clear. Um, I can confirm that we do currently accept cartons, so those wax containers that's been referred to, they are acceptable in our service. Um, but as he rightly said, plastics is the area which causes most confusion, which the, the documentary that you've just mentioned, Chair, um, covered did highlight. And we can only accept certain types of plastics. So what governments are looking to do through the um, legislation that they're looking to introduce is obviously the consistency in collections forcing us all to collect the same materials, but they're also looking to improve the labelling on products so that it's very clear then which products can and can't be recycled. And I think that at the moment is the area that causes residents confusion. They assume plastic is plastic and therefore it can often go into the brown bin when actually that's not the case. We we can only accept certain types of plastic at the moment and a lot of the, the more flexible types of plastic in the films aren't acceptable. Um, and, and that's ultimately where the confusion comes from. But of course, we, we can look at doing um, more communications um, and I agree, it, it does often need to be drip fed to residents. Can I just come okay. back on the, on the, yep, can I just come back on the plastics? Um, you, you, at the moment, you do have to make an effort to, to have to look for the triangle, um, and I've I've got got a bit of card up on the thing that says one, two, and five are the ones that we can. I think they're the ones that we can recycle. But often, um, the actual triangle is very difficult to find. It can be absolutely minute, so we're not actually making it. I mean, this is nothing to do with the council, but it's 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 not making recycling uh, as easy as possible. As you say, people do need to be spoon fed, and we're we're not exactly doing a very good job of it at, at the moment. Okay, thanks, Graham. Nicola, do you want to come back at all? Um, I, I mean, Councillor Oakley's point's very, very valid. Again, the, the triangle that's been referred to is a kind of identification triangle. Um, and, and no, not all products do include them, but hopefully government's aspirations around improved labelling will, will address those issues going forward. OK, thanks. Got Joanna, then David. Um. Yeah, you asked for suggestions as to what the council can do. And actually, I've got a few. Um, one is what I already talked about, the premises, you know, seeing if 
it is possible for to try and get some premises, for example, for the Library of Things kind of brokering what the local groups need and what might be available on short leases or in other ways. Um, yeah, I mean, what Linda Gruby said about water swallows was really interesting. I wonder if we could continue to have information about that, which can then be told to residents, because I'm sure a lot of them would be interested. Um, and also on, I mean, there's been a lot about a sort of closed loop in this conversation, but very little about actually discouraging use of plastic and other things, but particularly plastic. So can the council sort of work as people come back to work? I mean, I know at the moment it's sort of irrelevant, but can the council kind of work to try and discourage people drinking drinks out of plastic bottles, for example? This has come up before and it came up actually in the plastics working group, the single use plastics working group, which perhaps has been superseded by the new government consultation. Um, but, you know, can the council kind of look at its internal practice and try and reduce the use of plastic and in fact other other things, as I'm sure it has done over the years, but you know, you can always do more like paper, anything really cars and so on okay so thanks joanna Oops, sorry so there is some comments coming up on the in the in the chat bit Uh, there's a document, yeah, Jean shared a document around uh, what you can uh, what what you can recycle. Uh, there's details for that in the chat. We will get some more information when we've got it available circulated on the uh, additional facility up at Water Swallows. And we'll flag that up with regeneration around looking if there is any options around sort of being able to promote or support sort of short term uh, lets and there's a general sort of sort of standing policy around where where possible sort of being able to reduce some of the resources the council's using directly, uh, particularly in terms of, sort of paper, plastic use, etc. Okay, David. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, comment on the the weekly food recycling. I'm surprised at that. Perhaps I just don't have that much waste. But I mean, I struggle to fill up the the, the caddy once a week. Never mind. Uh, uh, the, the green wheeler bin. What's the latest on black trays, food trays, Nicola? Are the government going to ban those? Because, I mean, that is a real bind when you can't recycle those. Um, in the consultations that are out at the moment, there is no discussion about the use of black plastic per se. Um, clearly, the plastic tax is aiming to drive an increased use in plastic um, and recycle plastic and products, whether that will design out black plastic. I mean, I know personally um, from you know, obviously doing my shopping, um, a lot of the supermarkets, etc., are seemingly moving to alternative colours um, where black plastic was often used before. So I think there is a recognition from producers that there is a need to change some of their products and, and hopefully um you know that will be designed out through the the raft of changes in this legislation but it doesn't mention a ban in any of the documents um at the moment okay david do you want to come back at all no thanks Chair. okay any more comments issues or suggestions for things that we can look at No, in that case, we'll move on to oh, Amanda. Yes, hi. Um, I'm just wondering, I'm, I don't know, I'm not particularly familiar with the structure in terms of the council and what positions you have, but do you actually have somebody who is driving forward that sustainable consumption and production piece for the council, either at the, you know, the, the, the county council level or at the high peak level? Sorry, how do you mean? 
who who is responsible for driving things like the circularity forward and looking at st strategy for it and helping support that? But, well, I suppose overall, it it would come down to us as the elected members to make sure we're directing it right in terms of the policies. Uh, mm -hmm. But if Nicola or one of the marks wants to advise on the board day to day aspect of it. Um, I, I, I'm not not quite sure on um, Amanda's question really and, and the angle, but I mean my responsibility um, sits in regards to waste policy. Obviously, I'm I'm kind of the lead um, officer for the council in regards to waste matters, but I, I don't necessarily cover um, everything. Obviously, in my remit, so mm -hmm. I'm not. 100% um, sure, but I mean, I suppose I could be a point of contact if there was something that you were thinking um, we could work on. Yeah, I think it was with Nicola. Thank you. It was with both with both those angles. It was it was. Is there a gap, and do you have a need for somebody to help support you with that aspect, or you know, who who is the best person to come to if there are pots of funding that I come across that could help to leverage that drive towards because a lot of the conversation we've been having at the moment has been definitely about, you know, recycling. And you know, the, the circular com economy is, is beyond that and we need to think broader than that. Um and I think it would just it would just be interesting to know if you know if there were views or there was the, the idea that that was going to come up. Do you have, do you, I mean, you've got a biodiversity group. Do you have a cons sustainable consumption and production group that would feed into that at the county council level? I, I don't know. This is just a, a general question. It's not a, a nitpick. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, not sure with you at the moment, say, to be honest. <laughs> sorry, could I just say that uh, my role is the climate change and environment uh, um, in the exec. Um, for for High Peak Borough Council. And um, at, the, at DCC level, that they do have a climate change officer there as well. Yeah. Um, there, there are various people that feed into that, that role, I would say. Yeah. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Thanks, Jean. Thanks. OK, if there's nothing more, we shall move on. Uh, and although some elements of this have been covered already, our next agenda item is from Jean around consistency in household and business recycling in England consultation. Sorry, I think we've just covered that. <laughs> OK, <laughs> uh, is there any questions or comments directly relating to that? No, in that case, then we'll move on to our final item, which is the date of the next meeting, which is set for the 8th of July. Is everyone OK with that date? Yes. OK. I think that's OK. Uh, in that case, then, if I could thank you all for your attendance this evening and wish you all a safe journey from your chairs and sofas to wherever else you may be going. This